test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a client who wants to rent short-term accommodation and a rental agent. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Ace Accommodation. How can I help you? Good morning. I'd like to organize some short stay accommodation on the Gold Coast, please. Certainly. Who am I speaking to? Miss McKinley. Sylvia McKinley. Could you spell your family name for me, please? It's M-A-C-K-I-N-L-A-Y. Thank you. And your first name is Sylvia? Yes. Is that with an I or a Y? A Y, the old-fashioned way. That's S-Y-L-V-I-A. Thank you, Miss McKinley. Now, just for our records, can you tell me what country you live in? Of course. It's England, actually. I thought so. Now, when are you coming? Well, at the moment, we're planning on arriving on July the 26th. Oh, the 25th. That's the last day of the public holiday, and it might be difficult to find something available on that date. No, we're coming on the 26th of July. Oh, well, that's fine then. We'll have lots of good places vacant by then, although you wouldn't be able to move in until late afternoon because our cleaning crew will need time to get everything ready for you. That suits us. Our flight won't get in until early evening anyway. How many of you will there be? Just my sister and myself. And how long do you intend to stay for? Oh, only a couple of weeks. We'd like to stay longer, but we'll have to get back to work. So, you're not coming on business, then? No, it's just a holiday. Why? What difference does that make? Oh, you'd be surprised. Business people have different needs. You know, wireless internet, even fax machines and photocopiers. No, we won't need any of that stuff. We'll be coming to relax and get away from all that kind of thing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Good. Now, what exactly are you looking for? A house, a duplex, or an apartment? What's a duplex? Oh, that's what you might call a townhouse or a unit. You know, two houses semi-detached on the same property. Oh, I see. I think an apartment will suit us just fine. And how many bedrooms? Two. One or two. It depends on the size. My sister and I don't mind sharing, if it's a decent-sized bedroom with two beds. Well, that makes it easier. And car parking? Will you require a lock-up garage? They're a little harder to find with an apartment. We'll have a higher car, and as far as I know, there are no regulations concerning car parking. I think as long as it's not parked on the street and it's secure, there shouldn't be any problems. OK. Now, I'm assuming you want something by the beach. Yes, that's the idea. We want to enjoy the surf, sand and sunshine. OK, but before we settle on an area and discuss your price range, I'll need to know about other necessities. What do you mean? Well, for example, do you want to be close to a shopping mall or the casino or the fun parks? 
Or do you want to be in a complex with or near a swimming pool? No, none of that really matters to us. But we'd like to have reasonable access to the motorway so that we can drive up to Brisbane to visit friends there. Well, there are quite a few lovely small towns to choose from. There's Main Beach, which is north of Surfer's Paradise, or Mermaid Waters, which is a bit further south, or Palm Beach, which is quite a bit further south. Mermaid Waters sounds delightful. Is it close to the motorway? Well, not really. The M1 is actually closest to Palm Beach, and prices are likely to be more reasonable there, too. That's settled, then. Palm Beach it is. Now, if you'll just give me your email address, I can send you information about the town and lots of photos. Well, my email is smac13 at hotmail.com. And one final thing. How much are you looking to spend per week on accommodation? Do you want something at the luxury end of the market? You know, newly redecorated, great views, all the mod cons? Not necessarily. Could we get something clean, comfortable and reasonable for $1,200 a week? Could you stretch that to $1,500 a week? I've got a property in mind that you'll absolutely love, but you'd have to go to $1,500. 1200 wouldn't cover it. All right, then. But that's our top limit. Good. I'll get on to this straight away, and there should be something in your inbox shortly. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a student counsellor giving information and advice about further study. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Are you thinking about further study? Well, listen to this before you make a decision. It will help you decide if going on to tertiary study is right for you, and it will help you make good decisions for the right reasons. It includes information about student life, what it will cost, and the different ways you can support yourself. What should you think about first? Well, obviously, you're thinking about tertiary study, and it's one of the biggest decisions you'll make in your life. What you decide now will affect the rest of your life. It's the last year of high school for most of you, and you're busy and under pressure. Perhaps you're thinking of going abroad, getting a job or working for just a year or two to save some money before getting back to study. Let's assume you're choosing to continue studying next year. It's important that you set yourself goals and plan how you're going to achieve them. First off, career goals. What career do you want to pursue or what is it your parents want you to do? Then you need to think about employment opportunities at the end of your study. Will your qualification assist you in finding a rewarding job? Thirdly, course selection. Exactly what qualifications will you need? For instance, a degree, a diploma, or something else? Now we're down to study goals. The number of papers you can study at a time 
and what sort of grades you would like to attain. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, how do you make all that happen? You might feel overwhelmed by all the choices, but there are people and agencies to help. Career Services is a great website with lots of useful information and a search tool for finding courses and providers throughout the country. Then. There are the tertiary education institutions themselves. Universities and institutes of technology, for example, have comprehensive information on their particular websites. You can find out most anything there. Many campuses have a student support association and they can tell you a lot about what to expect. Don't be afraid to ask them anything. I'm sure they've heard it all before. It might also be worthwhile to make inquiries with potential employers to see if they will fund or partially fund your studies. If it is a trade you want to learn, the apprenticeship scheme will help you earn while you learn. That way you'll get valuable work experience while you're studying. If you're still at school, then search out your school careers advisor who will have a variety of information and resources at hand and be able to give you the kind of guidance you need to make a fully informed decision. And last but not least, don't forget your parents and other family members. They can be of enormous help too. Oh, one last thing that might help you make up your mind. Have you thought of applying for a scholarship? Some embassies, governments and individual institutions offer scholarships to cover part or all of your study fees. Most large libraries have a comprehensive catalogue of the various grants, awards and scholarships that are available. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a lecturer and a psychology student asking for advice about research methods. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning. Now, what is it you want to discuss today? Good morning, Dr. Reed. This assignment you've given us is the first psychology experiment I've had to do, and I'm not sure where to begin or which steps to take. Well, conducting your first psychology experiment can be quite a complicated and confusing process. But just remember that like other sciences, psychology uses the scientific method and bases its conclusions upon empirical evidence. What do you mean by empirical evidence? Ah, well, empirical evidence is established by observation 
rather than theory. And the scientific method? Oh, yes. When conducting an experiment, you need to follow a few basic steps. I know the first step is to come up with a research question or problem. Yes, a question that can be tested. How do I find an appropriate question? I would suggest one of three methods. Firstly, you can investigate a commonly held belief, or what we call folk psychology. I see. So I could examine the belief that staying up all night to study for an important exam can adversely affect test performance. That's right. In that case, you would compare the scores of students who stayed up all night with those of students who got a good night's sleep. I think I could do that. Well, alternatively, you might want to consider reviewing the literature on psychology. You know, published studies can be a good source of unanswered research questions. I'm sure you've read papers where the authors note the need for further research. So I would come up with some questions that remain unanswered? Correct. But there is a third source of ideas. Just think about everyday problems and then consider how you could investigate potential solutions. OK. Perhaps I could study various memorization strategies to find out which are the most effective. That's the idea. Next, you need to define the variables. You know, anything that might have an effect on the outcome of your research. Yes. I remember we learnt about that last week. Yes, that's right. Then you have to develop a testable hypothesis that predicts how the variables are related. For example, students who are sleep deprived will perform worse in an exam than students who are not sleep deprived. Exactly. Once you have developed a hypothesis, you must carry out background research. I can use books, journals, online databases and websites. Yes, all of those. I covered the reasons for background research in last Friday's lecture, didn't I? What you have to remember at this stage is to take careful notes and generate a bibliography of your sources. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK, I've got that. Then I'm ready to develop an experimental design. Well, again, you have a choice. There are three basic designs and each has its own strengths and weaknesses. The pre-experimental design does not include a control group, so there is no comparison. What we call a quasi-experimental design does incorporate a control group, but there is no randomization, whereas a true experimental design has both control groups and random assignment to groups. You've also told us about standardization of procedures. Is this where that comes in? Being sure to compare apples to apples? Absolutely. Going back to your sleep deprivation example, the same exam would have to be given to each participant in the same way at the same time, etc. Got it. When selecting subjects, you need to consider different techniques. If you were to go through with your sleep deprivation experiment, you would need to ensure that your experimental and control groups were standardised, that is, all third-year accounting students, for instance. A simple random sample involves choosing a number of participants from a group of similar people. On the other hand, a different kind of study might involve a stratified random sample, where participants are randomly chosen from different subsets of the population. You mean subsets with distinctive characteristics, like age, gender, race, 
socioeconomic status, and so on. Precisely. Then the next step is to actually conduct the experiment and collect the data. Then I have to analyze the data. I'll be dealing with the statistical methods for analyzing data in next week's lecture. Oh, good. I guess all that's left then is to write up the data. Yes, communicating your results is important. And in the next couple of lectures, I'll be covering the format and structure of a psychology paper and tips for writing each section. Thank you, Dr. Reed. I feel much more confident in getting started now. Thank you for taking the time to see me. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk by a health studies lecturer on anxiety. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My talk today is on anxiety. Anxiety is something you've all experienced at some time in your life, so you'll know that it's an emotional condition in which feelings of dread, fear, and mental agitation predominate. However, what we call an anxiety state or anxiety neurosis or phobic state they all mean the same thing, is characterized by anxiety reactions far greater than those normally expected for the circumstances, and these reactions may be severe and prolonged. This is the most common form of neurosis in westernized countries. Usually, normal anxiety decreases with repeated exposure to the feared situation, whereas a neurotic anxiety tends to increase. Gradually, the person is inclined to avoid the feared situation and views it with increasing dread. Sometimes there may be an inherited tendency for this, but usually environmental issues are more important. The individual may have been a worrier throughout life, and a stressful condition, just before <laughs> symptoms set in, is common. Often there is a gradual build-up of anxiety, possibly for weeks or months before the ultimate break occurs. The precipitating cause is usually one of great significance to the patient, often related to personal events, such as bereavement, a breakup, threats to career, health, or personal integrity. What are the symptoms of phobia? Well, phobic states often develop into severe, crippling challenges that can be very difficult to overcome. The person develops a fear of certain situations. It's not uncommon to have one or more of these present at the same time. I'm going to name some frequent phobias and give you a description of their symptoms. Let's start with agoraphobia, which is when the person has an intense anxiety about venturing outside the safety of the normal home surroundings. It may be impossible for this person to ever go out alone. Their fear of public or open spaces is completely irrational, and they often end up leading very secluded lives. Claustrophobia, on the other hand, is a morbid fear of closed-in areas or places. If you see me taking the stairs instead of the lift, think about it. Am I trying to get more exercise? Or am I trying to avoid the confined interior of the lift? 
and I'm sure you all know people who are afraid of flying. Sometimes it's the fear of being enclosed in the aeroplane itself, and you can imagine how the cramped confines of airline toilets are really bad news for these sufferers. Now I'll move on to discuss social phobia, which, believe it or not, is more common in men. It's an acute anxiety that develops when they are in the presence of others. They feel self-conscious, apprehensive, and embarrassed. If attention, real or imagined, is focused on the sufferer, he becomes uneasy and may blush, stammer, or stutter. Some sufferers even develop tremors, shaking or trembling movements of a part or parts of the body. Or another very common sign of their extreme discomfort is that they perspire profusely on their palms, under their arms or on their feet. That brings me to the last one that I want to mention today, and that is single phobia. And no, it's not a fear of lifelong bachelorhood. This one is actually precipitated by an acute aversion to dogs, cats, spiders. You may have heard of the term arachnophobia. Well, it applies specifically to spiders. But any single thing can basically cause a strong aversion. Snakes, frogs, mice, or rats, for instance. I can assure you, the list is unlimited. You name it, and someone is sure to have a phobia about it. Some people are terrified of the dark, for example. And I'm not talking about young children here. You'd be surprised how many adults are afflicted in this way. Well, I see our time is up. Next week I'll go into some of the treatments and therapies for phobias that have been used over the ages, and some of the relatively new drugs that have recently come on the scene. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.